You're listening to the Cryptid Creature Show. If you're a fan of the show, go and check out our new Patreon site. You'll get access to our private Discord server, exclusive merchandise, access to all live streams and Q&As, discounts on merch from the Cryptid Creature store, and get a chance to be a guest host during one of the show's recordings. Just go to www.patreon.com slash crypticcreatures1. Thank you for listening and supporting the show. This is the Cryptid Creature Show. I am Brian, and with me is always my co-host, Todd. What's up, buddy? Brian, my friend, we finally made it happen. I know. I'm very excited about this one. We are getting Jeff Meldrum on the show tonight to Woo-hoo! talk to him. We've talked about this in past episodes. We said we we're going to do this, and we finally got a hold of him. We finally got him. We met him at Salt Fork at the Ohio mm-hmm. Bigfoot Conference, and he's coming on the show tonight to talk to us. So we are really yeah. pumped about this. I know. I'm very excited about this one. I don't want to waste any more time. Let's bring him on. What do you say? Yep, let's get him. Dr. Meldrum, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here, sir. My pleasure. Yeah, we're excited. Been trying to get you for a long time. Is that right? Well, so ever since COVID, uh, the podcasts and Zoom uh, options have just multiplied. Like, I mean, it got crazy there for a while where I was doing... Um, uh, three or four, sometimes five, every, every night, uh, wow. some, some conversation. Yeah, it got ridiculous. So I've, I've kind of, uh, it has slowed, it has slowed down, and I've been a little more discriminating <laughs> in my, what I agree to do. But anyway, I'm glad to be here. Thanks. We appreciate well, it. Glad to have you. Yes. Yeah. You are the professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University. That's correct. What got you interested in that field of work? Well, um, I like to think that this topic actually had some influence. I mean, e- even when I was first introduced to Bigfoot, I was already very uh, uh, passionate about natural history and, and you know, all things uh, biological. I, uh, you know, I was the little naturalist running around collecting collecting all kinds of artifacts. My room was like a little natural history museum. And I had always had aquaria with, with reptiles or amphibians or fish and, and occasionally the orphaned uh, gopher (laughs) would find its way into our house. And uh, so, um, and and I, along that way, I, my interest in primates really became acute. I mean, I, I, did not have the opportunity for to be an amateur primatologist per se, but but um, you know this was the age, the golden age of Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and National Geographic articles and documentaries, and I was just fascinated with primates and um, and those who studied them. And so, um, but eventually, I mean, I went through you know the roulette wheel kind of so to speak of potential careers from uh, wildlife biologist to veterinarian. In fact, when I entered college, it was in a pre-veterinary track, but the uh, the economy kind of took a dive and really veterinary science, veterinary careers took a hit. And uh, uh, the uh, competition was very steep and, 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 and my attention quickly got distracted into other, other things, other directions as I, pursued um uh this line of work i literally you know this was in the age prior to the internet and so uh didn't have the benefit of that (laughs) that repository of of knowledge at one's fingertips and so i can remember the day i finally kind of sat down and thought you know I'd, i'd pretty much decided that veterinary medicine just wasn't going to pan out and um uh, and I wanted, quite honestly, I, I really, if I went into veterinary medicine, I wanted to do exotic animal, be a zoo vet, you know, and that was extremely competitive and, and difficult to get uh, into those, those uh, positions. And um, not that I wasn't a competitive person, but it's just, uh, I remember going to the university library and literally going through the stacks, pulling out introductory text in various related subject matter in the life sciences and the social sciences and 
and uh, I pulled the text of uh, an intro to physical anthropology as it was now it's more called more frequently biological anthropology and and the scope varies a little bit uh, depending on your point of view and personal experience with the subject matter but but back then it had you know it had primate behavior and comparative anatomy the fossil record of hominin and primate evolution and uh, you know all that went with that uh, the evolution of modern human diversity and and right about that time there was a cohort of specialists in early hominin evolution especially bipedalism of which which was thought to really define that that group of organisms um, that came out of uh, SUNY Stony Brook. And so that was, I, I was just, I mean, this was what I wanted to do. It was this big, hefty uh, paper that appeared in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology on the locomotor anatomy of Australopithecus afarensis, commonly known as Lucy's kin. And um, it, uh, yeah, that was that was what I wanted to do, and that's what I set my sights on. And yeah, I'm in. You know, I here I am. So, uh, like I said, I'm a I'm a competitive type to a degree, and, and uh, if uh, if there's a goal, I'll uh, put my nose to the grindstone and my shoulder to the wheel and ear to the ground or whatever it takes to, to get there. So that's how I ended up that way. Now now. Um, anthropologists uh, also uh, physical anthropology went through its own kind of period of saturation and and um, uh, challenge to young scholars finding employment in academia and about that time traditional departments of of anatomy were becoming more and more and more subcellular molecular in their emphases of research and there were therefore as a result a uh, few faculty fewer faculty who were qualified let alone inclined to teach human gross anatomy which was one of the foundational courses in in all medical training um, medical schools and other allied health professional schools and so they began to look a field for faculty to fill those positions and this opened up a a new uh a new uh field of or a new um, selection of positions for people with with my background and uh, and these programs were tailored specifically to those kinds of employment positions so i'm not a traditional anthropologist in the in the classical training but I'm uh, an anatomist with a heavy emphasis, research emphasis in physical anthropology and evolutionary morphology. And so, it, I mean, it ended up dovetailing remarkably well. I, whether there was this subliminal influence or not, you know, at the time I was pursuing this career, my interest in Sasquatch in relic hominoids, per se, was completely latent. It was dormant. And... Um, it, it got, you know, it had experienced periodic, um, you know, flashes of, uh, of curious uh, curiosity and interest as, as certain things, news items or whatever, new, new documentaries or movies came across. But, um, but when, I, when I was pursuing my doctorate and that, it wasn't even really on the radar. Uh, and so I, I found myself, however, because of that interest in bipedalism and that focus on the lower extremity and particularly the foot as it was adapted through time to the habit of walking on two legs, found myself in a very advantageous, very qualified position to evaluate this footprint evidence, build upon what uh, Dr. Krantz, Grover Krantz, had sort of established through his researches, but carry it further much further than than he had ever uh, envisioned because uh, he, he was much more broadly trained as a anthropologist not as a, specifically as an anatomist so here we are <laughs> speaking of that you're the one that brought to light the mid-tarsal break in the bigfoot uh, 
footprints. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. I think you know there there are places where Grover kind of alluded to uh, uh, higher degrees of flexibility, the range of flexibility in the foot in the in the Sasquatch foot, but he did not understand the concept of the presence of this uh, extreme range of motion, this hinge almost a r r rotational hinge in the midfoot as described as the mid-tarsal break. Uh, Hicks had applied this to his observations of the way chimpanzees walked on the ground uh, decades earlier, back in the 40s. And, uh, and of course, then that correlated, that was a carryover from an adaptation for climbing up uh, vertical supports, tree trunks and branches and steeply inclined substrates where a grasping hand-like foot with a big toe that was akin to a thumb sticking out there greatly enlarged and and enhanced by comparison say to a baboon's foot where the inside toe is almost an appendage the baboons have become rather digitigrade and just as your dog walks up on the ends of the digits such that the inner toe doesn't touch the ground it's gotten smaller and smaller we call it a dew mm -hmm. claw now and a lot of dogs breeds they snip them off so that they don't get snagged or uh or aren't uh, in the way during grooming and so forth um so apes are quite distinctive in that adaptation and as a result the loss of divergence of the big toe it is a big toe you know, the inner toe of a bear, for example, is more thumb-like. It's short, even on the foot, it's short. And, uh, you know, we have only two phalanges, two bones in our thumb versus three in our other digits. The same holds true for our inner toe, our big toe, and, and the others. But that, but that big toe has been emphasized as a result of that heritage for climbing of the trees. So the mid-tarsal break was the phrase that Hicks uh, coined to describe that. It's a little confusing people because it's an it's a more antiquated use of the term break one of the one of the definitions. It's not to break something as in to damage it to to shatter it into two pieces, but rather it is a an axis of flexion. The flexion occurs along a break, uh, an axis of bending or um, rotation. And um, it's pivotal. Uh, I mean, I'm so confident. It's not like I'm I'm proposing one possible interpretation. It's either this or the whole thing is is a, a prank and contrived and a hoax. I mean, we can sit and watch this very action of the foot take place in the Patterson Gimlin film, and correlates remarkably, you know, astoundingly with the footprints and some of the clearest examples of, of the um, trace of that mid-tarsal break. And we've, we have multiple examples of it, um, uh, you know, beyond the Patterson-Gimlin film site that reiterate that. On top of that, we have the half tracks, the running tracks where the foot collapses into flexion across that mid-tarsal break. We have uh, you know, the interpretation of the proportions of the foot are borne out very dramatically as well by the placement of the bunionettes on the cripple foot, the Bosberg cripple foot, which, which was pivotal in convincing Kranz that the, the cripple foot is what tipped the scales for him uh, because, because that pathology is so anatomically accurate to think of someone coming up with that back in in the in the time that it made its appearance um, you know the, the the whole notion of biomechanics was still kind of and human biomechanics was still kind of in its infancy and sure there were some there were some uh, podiatrists that might have been or orthopedic surgeons that might have been familiar with the uh, uh, the uh, occurrence of those kind of bunionettes in the face of the derangement, the pulling apart of the joints. But, but uh, 
I mean, I've, I've had conversation in, and with podiatrists and they either get it or they don't. There's very little middle ground. And what I mean by that is I've had, you know, these really um, sort of animated discussions because I can't believe, a, 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 or I, I'm amazed at the density, you know, not to be smug or to be egotistical, but the inability of, of these clinicians to see beyond a human foot they you know they don't I, there was one fellow in particular who who wrote a review a critique of my discussion of the mid tarsal break and on every single point he was off the mark and the reason he was off the mark he his calibration was off because he was trying to force everything into the mold of a human foot and uh, you know he said you can't have I, he said i've dealt with patients that have these hypermobile midfoots or a list franc fracture you know that is, that roughly coincides with that same region of the instep and he said they're debilitated they can't walk and i my response was have you ever seen a chimpanzee walk <laughs> they walk and run <laughs> and jump and climb just fine and they show all of these features i'm describing and attributing to the sasquatch foot you know, I said, you're, you're missing the boat. You're literally missing the forest for the trees. And uh, on the other hand, I gave a talk at Massachusetts General Hospital to a room full of podiatrists who got it and were uh, fascinated by it. I mean, they were just amazed. And, you know, for them, they had no, no dog in the fight. It was purely a clinical case study that they were intrigued by and in trying to come up with a uh, a differential diagnosis of, uh, but they were absolutely comfortable with the anatomy that was portrayed there as very reasonable, very rational, mm -hmm. very real, you know. And then the and I and I, I know this may depending on your audience, this, some of these stories are repetitive, but it's it's hard to <laughs> have a fresh answer to some of these questions with the right. same same old same old questions. But I mean, they're important questions. But um, what really was the slam dunk was when I had the opportunity to go to China and here were a pair of casts that had been uh, collected by a game ward, a former um, military man in the Red Army who had been involved in, in the Beijing, not the Beijing, excuse me, the uh, Shenanjia area where they were searching for the wild man uh, of Hubei. Hubei province, and he had had an encounter, reported encounter, had visual sighting, and followed up with uh, by tracking it, and found footprints in soft mud alongside a spring, and made a right and a left cast, very clear cast of, of the right and left feet, and they showed. I mean, they were dead ringers. Uh, if if he if he had had a copy of the Titmus cast from the Bluff Creek film site. Batters Gimlin film site, he couldn't have made a better facsimile of what that anatomy um, entailed. And yet he had no way. Uh, he, he had no knowledge of Sasquatch. He didn't speak English. He couldn't have read the literature. Um, the, uh, they, their, their television did, doesn't include the cable TV series and documentaries that we have. So where would he have gotten the notion of including this mid-tarsal pressure ridge in the right place, the right orientation, the right proportionalities. I mean, this footprint was maybe just a half inch wider than the uh, patty track from from uh, the, the example of the Titmus cast. Um, but otherwise, it was remarkably similar in so many other details. When I sat, when you know, when he pulled those those casts out of out of uh, his little suitcase there and un unwrapped uh, the toweling, packing them. I mean, the discussion was over. I mean, nobody with any appreciation for the basis of this model of the foot witnessing that independent, wholly independent example could not be just blown out of the water by the corroboration that it provides for this i mean it it gets down to where where um 
you know, when people ask me if I believe, well, no, I don't believe. I'm convinced. It's not a. It's not a position of, of faith. It's a position of evidence-based conviction. But I mean, I'm as convinced as you can be, short of having the physical specimens sitting right in front of me, you know, looking me in the eye or not. Mm-hmm. But uh, well, if we ever get a hold of one, you're the first person we're coming to yeah, see. Yeah, we'll bring it right to your desk. That Great. I promise you. Yeah, I'll be. <laughs> well, you've also found that. you've also found like dermal ridges in in some of these castings, right? There are yes, and uh, Dr. Krantz was one of the first to draw attention to these and to publish on them. Um, I actually had become aware prior to his to his um, uh, making a, a much broader evaluation of the evidence from the blue mountains outside of walla walla from the freeman collection largely um there was actually a little cryptozoology club at the uh, university of nor or the college of northern idaho at that time and um, they had investigated a report a local report up there in the idaho panhandle and the witnesses had not only seen a creature, but had found tracks and had made a cast. But in this case, they made, they made a, a very interesting cast out of epoxy resin, which when you're working at that kind of quantity, it, you know, you, it's a very exothermic reaction. And you, I was amazed that they were able to get such a good result. But the result showed um, positive dermatoglyphics which these students drew attention to you know and and the first concern was well the, were they just ridge detail that was transferred to a kind of a tacky not not completely hardened plastic uh cast and no they're not because as i said they are, were positives the the ridges bulge outward if you see pattern and the br- ridges uh, are impressed into the substrate that's transfer from someone handling the subject uh the the object and so uh they they clearly were not um you know um, serendipitously transferred from the students handling or the witnesses handling this epoxy material but it was grover who drew attention who got other latent fingerprint examiners involved and who wrote up his uh, his observations and the findings of some of those experts, those uh, expert examiners and dermatoglyphists, uh, anthropological dermatoglyphists. Then I had mentioned this on a documentary interview and it caught the ear of uh, Officer Jimmy Chilcutt, who it happened um, was going kind of above and beyond the call of duty. This guy, he he had an eye and a memory that was amazing. I mean, he he could, um, you know, usually you rely on APHIS, the the uh, archival system that looks for the points of commonality. He had such a an ability to to um, take a a mental image that he could actually sometimes remember back to cases, you know, based they'd find fingerprints at a scene of a crime, a burglary or a car theft, they'd lift a print, he'd look at that and he goes, I know that print. Sure enough, he'd go back to the files of Colt and here's the perp (laughs) and they'd make the match. So um, he was fascinated by uh, and had, because of that ability to to recognize patterns like that, he started noticing some prevailing patterns that characterized certain ethnic groups. I mean, it was logical that there are there's there is some genetic basis to the um, prevalence of certain types of patterns, certain forms, as well as even some of the texture, the coarseness, and so forth. So he was curious about that. He had some sort of um, some sort of parochial notions about evolution of the races. Uh, But he figured 
that if he, that he could maybe gain some insight into the pattern of relationships amongst the races you know which were more derived which were which contained more uh, ancestral characteristics by looking at non-human primates and uh, noting the distribution of different pattern frequencies and so forth amongst different species of great ape. So, I mean, it was interesting to me from a strictly comparative basis and establishing some polarity of character states, but, but his ideas about, you know, how this influenced the, the, uh, the evolutionary history of the races was, ha had no footing in modern anthropology, but he had taken this initiative because of this fascination and it started printing um uh the hands mostly not so much the feet obviously because uh, they're interested in fingerprints now, now had we been in india latent fingerprint examiners in india where people a, a large fraction of the population spends their life unshod barefooted um the patterns and so forth and characteristics that define footprints from flexion creases right up you know through to to, to the individual dermatoglyphic patterns on the sole and fingerprints on toes tend to be way back more on the stem of the toe and so rarely are, are left by the toe tips so you have to have a really good full imprint of the foot say in mud or something where so that the core patterns the loops and whirls and arches will show up so, but anyway, so so unfortunately, Jimmy, Officer Chilcott, was not printing the feet of his subjects, but he'd 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 go out and make arrangements with the zoos, and they would contact him whenever they were doing a, a set of uh, physical exams that required anesthetizing the apes, and then he'd go in and have a free run at, at taking fingerprints and palm prints of these so he over the several you know number of years had amassed quite a quite a uh, collection um there's a lot of material in the literature too some of which he was unaware of which i was able to point him to but he had quite a sense of humor he said one time a veterinarian came through and saw him taking the fingerprints of the gorilla and he goes he goes he says, are you fingerprinting that gorilla? He goes, yeah, I'm here to investigate the banana heist. <laughs> the vet uh, thought that was, uh, that was mildly humorous, but he couldn't understand why this police officer was interested in uh, taking fingerprints. But we still have all those on file, and I, I had hoped to do some more work with them. Ch uh, Ch Chilcutt has retired, and and other interests have uh, have drawn his attention various directions but um the thing now I, I should point out this is an important point the transfer of fingerprints to or, or of dermatoglyphics rather of the feet to a footprint and their preservation in a cast is extremely rare because it requires a substrate and the consistency of that substrate uh, to be fine enough such that it will take and hold that fine detail. That means the, the substrate has to be a very fine particulate size, like... Um, like sand? Like, well, sand often is too coarse. So like the road dust on a logging road, that pulverized talcum powdery, or around here in the, in the northwest, um, in the southern parts of, of Washington and down a big swath across Idaho, there are vast deposits, I mean meters thick in places, of what's called lus. And this is a glacial sediment that has been ground to the consistency of flour. They call it glacial flour sometimes. And so the, the tracks that Grover first uh, focused in on were all from southeastern Washington in the Blue Mountains, where the roadbeds are cutting into these lus deposits. And so it's just, I mean, it dusts like crazy when it's dry, but when it's wet, it's very clay. 
and it holds the detail quite nicely. Then you have to have someone who's adept enough at pouring plaster, getting a, a good consistency that it doesn't either wash away or under the weight of the plaster, stiff plaster, bulldoze its way through that fine detail. It also doesn't hold up under weathering conditions very well. Uh, so when it's very moist, obviously it the gravity literally starts to pull it down or if or if rainwater accumulates in a footprint it'll it'll obliterate smooth out those features or if it's in very fine dust every time a car goes by whoosh, it showers another cloud of dust across or it's like that scene in uh, uh fourth of july when the alien ship goes up uh, past the moon and and neil armstrong's footprints are all shaken out into <laughs> flattened out it's like that every time a big heavy truck or a car goes by it bounces and jiggles a little just enough to shake that those fine details out and then and then especially in that dust the, the weight of the plaster can obliterate them very easily unless the investigator you know uses some sort of consolidant so the bottom line is of my 300 footprint casts in the lab there's maybe a half a dozen good clear examples of dramatoglyphics just aren't very many to work with. So it's not like we've been able to take one individual and uh, you know map all of its dermatoglyphics and then and then here's a footprint of that individual over you know 40 miles away and say, oh look, the dermatoglyphics match up. Usually it's just little patches that have preserved and uh, persist and make it transferred to the cast. So it's it's fascinating, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't the slam dunk that that um, the morphology, you know, the story of the Chinese pressure ridge and mid tarsal break. Uh, I think that makes a far more compelling, quite honestly, a far more compelling um, argument. You've been a lot of expeditions. We know that probably sure. more than you can remember. Have yeah. you ever had any? close experiences or any kind of uh, relative experiences with anything big yeah related yeah very very early on i um, was privileged to participate in what was what became known as the six rivers expedition the six rivers wilderness area the um or national forest adjacent to and um including some of the siskiyou wilderness in northern california we were literally just one drainage over just one ridge over from bluff creek um, the, dr the drainage of Blue Creek. And um, we had something come into camp. We heard vocalizations in the wee hours of the night. And then um, I heard uh, we were awoken by the rustling, the disturbance of our backpacks. At the time, it was just two of us, um, our local contact, Mark, and uh, and I were in little bivy tents, these little one man um, tents that basically just have room for for a person and their sleeping bag. And there's a hoop across the across the center. They're a little more than a bivy sack, but our gear was stowed outside under the, you know the branches of of a bush mine stuffed into a big garbage bag con contractor's garbage bag and and uh, marks had a poncho it had a he had an external frame pack and so it was sitting there with the poncho wrapped up over and tucked in something was going at it in fact it was the sound of his you know the da little dangly uh, uh toggles on the um frame of the aluminum backpack uh frame that um that woke us up and uh, we could hear um, clacking noises too. It was like, uh, at first I thought it was rocks. <clears throat> and that has been reported by some witnesses, even you know, visually witnessing that. But in, there are also, when I read a report where the witness very accurate or very in detail described seeing the Sasquatch retreat, look back at him and clack its jaws clacking its teeth together not unlike a bear when it's a bear's nervous or anxious it'll do that baboons do it great apes will sometimes do it as well uh, I, and I, so i think that's what it was it we were socked in that night with a fog bank that came in off 
the coast and uh, it was like pea soup. So it made it quite eerie when you'd hear these vocalizations and these teeth clacking. You can't see more than about four or five feet in front of your face. Mm. It's so thick. And um, so we heard this clackety clack of the backpacks and, and both quickly extricated ourselves from our sleeping bag and our tent and the rain fly. You know, it wasn't a real swift <laughs> response necessarily, but as quick as we could, we were out, but the flashlights, you know, it's just like high beams on a car and in a fog bank, it just, you know, illuminated the fog and you couldn't see anything. And uh, whatever it was just kind of melted back into the fog apparently. And we stayed mm -hmm. out listening and watching, but the dank, that dank moisture cold uh, started to penetrate. So we eventually retreated back into our tents and, we're laying there and this was the coolest part for me. I'm laying there and, and I literally have my, you know, 45s laying across my, my chest and, uh, listening and, uh, and you could hear the footfalls pick up again and, and not only here, but actually, I mean, we're laying on the ground. So you could feel the, the that sort of hollow thump, uh, because of the, of, of the soil and leaf litter, we were under these huge, uh, huge uh, spruce trees, and and um, uh, and so the ground was kind of bare. That you know the needles make it kind of acidic, and nothing really grows except just little sparse grass. And you could hear the thump thump, and it was it was coming around towards the foot end of my tent, and then all of a sudden it picks up pace and it's coming. I can tell it's coming straight at me. Boom, 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 boom. And it ran right alongside the tent and must have, I assume it dragged its hand along the fly and hit the, that hoop up at my head. So my whole tent goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, <laughs> but I could see the fingertips, you know, or what I assumed were fingertips pressing through the top of the tent as it ran I, and I mean, the only thing I can think of, it was counting coup. It was, uh, you know, running up and touching the, touching the unknown. To mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it was curious. It was trying to, yeah. 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 I and didn't then, know that happened to you. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. And, and you can amazing. read about it. I, I go into it in some detail in the, in the front end of the book, uh, Sasquatch Ledger Meets Science, as uh, so that was sort of the introduction, but that was our first expedition which lasted you know over four weeks and um that was quite an experience i must say spending that amount of time in, in that remote area you know we had the we had the assistance of uh, some llamas to help carry our gear in so we were well equipped with sound equipment and recording equipment and and antiquated uh, camera traps that literally had fine line trip wires um you know uh strung across the trails and uh it was uh, you know not the modern modular designs today and especially not digital photography we had regular film we had so we would never we wouldn't know what we had until we got back and processed the film and so it was always but that was interesting. So uh, being that I'm on a nine month contract and I, and uh, only occasionally am called upon to cover say a summer offering of a course. And even then, you know, it usually we shoehorn them into an eight week, um, schedule. I always have at least a month during the summer that I can get away. And so I've, I've uh, annually participated in often extensive and sometimes very remote um outings and have had you know over the years have had some but i mean it's the old proverbial moon, moving needle in a haystack mm -hmm. we've had a you know several footprint finds that i'm quite confident in we've had some vocalizations that i just couldn't attribute you know interesting whistles or um uh and the, and the nocturnal the long distance call usually nocturnal sometimes in the daytime uh, which I think is their, you know, their loud call they use to space and 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 or attract um, con specifics, and uh, uh, we've had uh, those 
couple of close encounters, that one that I just described, and then most recently, just a few years ago, um, as a guest of Todd Standing, along with Dr. Bindernagel up in Alberta. And that was an interesting, where I actually caught a glimpse through night vision monocular. Uh, it wasn't ideal conditions. There was no moon up. Uh, and so it was just ambient starlight and the monocular has it, but it's, it's a generation three. So it's good quality, but you know, the noise as the light diminishes, the noise ratio increases. And, and with the binocular, you have that, uh, lack of the depth of field. So everything is collapsed into two dimensions, it seems, and makes it a little harder, a little more challenging to distinguish, um, features. But I mean, the best way I can describe it is if you we can, and, and it wasn't like just out of the blue, we had something again, approach camp, something vocalized, something was breaking brush, something sounded like it was as big as a bull moose uh, tromping through the undergrowth and uh, breaking branches when at one point it cracked a branch, well, cracked a branch or smacked a tree. It was like cracking a, a Louisville slugger, like if Matt Moneymaker had broken his little wood knocker, you know, it just crack, it just resonated. And, uh, and it was right then after that, that it broke from the shadows and crossed the roadbed, which was on the other side of a berm. We were camped right up as far as you could go on this road and it was blocked off with a berm. Uh, but against that uh, gravel, that light colored, you know, Rocky Mountain gravel, granite, it, um, you could see, if you imagine Patty, but completely jet black and obscured by the berm up to about mid thigh, just like Patty's obscured by the, the, the um, detritus from the flood um, and moving just smooth like that on, on compliant limbs, uh, it quickly, you know, disappeared into the tree line on the opposite side. And they, Dr. Bindernagel, John and, and uh, Todd were able to find footprints the next day. I had to leave the next day as it happened before sunup to get to the airport for my, my return flight. We'd been there five days and I had, to, I had a prior commitment and John stayed on for another two or three days with him. But if you if you're curious about that and it was an interesting experience and, and people unfortunately Todd is a very divisive personality yeah. uh, and controversial figure that is and uh, so but if you but if you, he, he produced a nice documentary that highlights what transpired up there with with uh, yeah himself. I watched it I got this I got to watch that one yeah you. and I must say he did a good job you know I was always chiding him because he has a tendency to name drop and he gets kind of you know hyperbolic <laughs> and uh uh not that not that he stretches the truth or anything but he just gets so enthusiastic about things and so adamant whereas you know john and i throughout as scientists are always tentative and qualify our, our conclusions based on the information at hand but you know subject to to revision in the face of new information. And um, so I almost wasn't going to say anything when I saw this figure. And, uh, but I really wanted, you know, I thought there was a good chance given it walked right there, uh, that there would be sign, there'd be footprints. And we'd been finding tracks, you know, when we walked on the moss, the, the understory, the, the forest floor and much of this forest is just a carpet of moss and we walk on it it's like walking on memory foam and for the most part it just rebounds but these footprints whatever was leaving these 13 and a half inch 14 inch footprints just a little shy of you know patty's foot compacting that moss so much that it didn't rebound it was crushed and so you could see footprints across you know across the forest floor and they they uh, were able to track it for some distance beyond where I had seen it cross the road. So, you know, everything, all the circumstances leading up to it and then the follow up, it was ambiguous and it is overshadowed, unfortunately, by 
association with Todd. Uh, I hate to say, for no fault, really. Well, I don't know how how much how much responsibility he bears for other people's prejudices. I mean, uh, Paul Freeman was the brunt of a lot of uh, undeserved criticism as well, and and uh, those who got to know him spent time in the field with him. I mean, he impressed John Mayanzinski, and anyone that can impress John Mayanzinski with their knowledge of the woods and and history of the natives and so forth is uh, is it stands pretty tall in my book as far as uh, their abilities. Now, he wasn't a scientist and perhaps didn't hold himself to the same standards of scientific um, you know, evidence and uh, integrity. Sometimes, you know, some people, the end justifies the means and a little, a little embellishment here or there just to get the message, to grease the wheels. Um, I think that that may have happened on occasion, uh, but uh, most of it was not foul play or um, or outright hoaxing you've heard the sierra sounds i'm sure many times at least yeah. we all have do you think uh they have their own type of language like that do you oh, think that's no. what that is no. no no i even if those are legitimate i don't think that that it justifies um the conclusion that they have language um i mean <clears throat> let me put it this way they, they don't have a sophisticated language uh, equivalent to that of, of a human. Uh, it, uh, I mean, animals are able to communicate to a much greater degree than we often give them credit. And the vocal repertoire and the, and the significance of sounds that are produced by the great apes uh, as our nearest kin are are themselves impressive and they may have some abilities at um, at the abstraction of language of communicating that way but uh, you know there have been lots of questions raised about even the the extent of the sign language and symbolic language used by by Coco the gorilla and, and other the other uh, apes that uh, were involved in language studies. There have been a lot of criticisms from some brutal reviews with 2020 hindsight and especially, and some abuses, I, you know, quite honestly, that I, I thinking of that ridiculous commercial with Coco contemplating, you know, the status of our planet. I mean, most, most humans that you, it's like Leno on the, on the street, most college students, don't comprehend the, the status of our planet, let alone a gorilla. And so, you know, this warm and fuzzy, um, uh, you know, woke, if you want to use that word, uh, perspective that, that, that you can see the hard editing breaks um, that they concocted for Coco, you know, calling the world to its... Uh, to its um, to live up to its stewardship, mm -hmm. uh, I think is an abuse. But um, back to the Sierra sounds, I, the the uh, evidence for pidgin English, I don't, um, I'm not convinced. Of, let's put it that way. Okay. And I hate to speak, you know, I, I don't I don't like to speak negatively of my colleagues, and I don't mean to to in any way uh, ad hominem attacks in any of the comments that I make, but I'm, but I have to draw attention to where my reservations lie and, uh, things that, uh, give me pause. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's just the notion that a solitary, all the evidence points to these creatures being quite solitary in their social behavior. And, uh, so a, a solitary being that that shuns human contact and is extremely elusive, except for those rare bump, you know, uh, uh, encounters, those rare encounters that all seem to be quite, uh, well, not all, 
largely serendipitous. I mean, I can think there's some uh, acknowledge there's some anecdotal evidence of, of purposeful, intentional contacts where Sasquatch just curiosity out out stripes strips its uh, its caution. But uh, you know, you just imagine you get dropped behind enemy lines. You don't know one single point of reference of of the language and just by eavesdropping on rare occasions you supposedly pick up enough uh language and association of vocabulary that you can incorporate words appropriately and why would you uh i mean the only the motivation for learning to someone else's language is to communicate with them right and i don't uh i don't i don't see that as the uh outcome of this pigeon english i've always been curious and this is just all i just throw this out as a point of of uh, conversation but i've always been curious by the observation of some tribal members that these creatures speak their native language and that they communicate with them in that language now what's interesting is i don't know of a real clear-cut uh profession that stating that they speak their language but that they communicate with them in their own language um, so around here it would be shoshone so i've had natives say yeah they they speak shoshone well again is it in your mind's ear <laughs> is it in your mind that you're hearing them speak shoshone do they actually articulate shoshone uh words and then um, you've, you've got uh, Scott uh, hearing Pigeon English, and the, the real um, clincher for me was when Scott acknowledged that he played some of these recordings for one of his fellow cryptolinguists who happened to be Japanese. And lo and behold, he heard Japanese words. So that, that for me was it. People just hear, whether it's Shoshone, hear something that sounds like a Shoshone word, so they must speak, they must be able to speak Shoshone. Scott hears food, food, and it sounds like the word food, and therefore they must be using Pidgin English. They must have incorporated some words. Uh, the dialogues, the dictation that he has, I, you know, that's sped up. If you slow it down, you can supposedly make it out better. And, um, the other thing that gives me pause, and I don't mean to cast, I mean, because I'm fascinated. There are aspects of the Sierra sounds that are really quite intriguing. Mm -hmm. But for me, the litmus test is the footprint record. And if you look at the footprints that have come out of that uh, whole um, uh, scenario, you'll have pause yourself <laughs> there. They're extremely wedge-shaped. They're wedge-shaped, you know, flaring with, you know, literally, as in, in the words of Rene de Hinden, when he's disparaging some of the Freeman footage, these do look like sausage toes. And you can't tell if you're looking at a right or a left. There's no, there's no anatomy, no convincing anatomy, no uh, bilateral symmetry. It's just this swim fin with Vienna sausage toes across the end, all the same size, all the same orientation. Now there's a couple others that are a little more, but the ones that have, and, and I, you know, asked Ron to share with me any footprint evidence that they had from the site, because I wanted some, I wanted some muster, some, uh, some co corroboration for this, um, amazing claim of, of this long-standing interaction, at least with that particular, uh, and that's an interesting aspect too, the fact that it was a transient experience, which seemed to, sh the dynamic seemed to shift when the uh, characters supposedly involved changed. And it almost got, gave the impression that there, that the, the male was the one that was curious about the human activity and kept kind of bringing some of the others along e either willingly or unwillingly <laughs> to interact with these funny, these strange creatures that, that slept in this stick house. 
And, um, but then later the interactions seemed to change and uh, they weren't there. And then of course, if you dig deep enough or you listen long enough to the stories, then the paranormal raises its head and there are balls of light, you know, bouncing through the forest and, and, and other things which I have no basis to evaluate. Um, I, uh, you know, my, my experience has been whenever I'm participating or present, none of this shenanigans takes place. So I'm either, I'm, so I'm accused and I would love to see it and experience it myself. Uh, but most people can't produce. I, one person did show me uh, a, a short video clip that was kind of interesting, but it wasn't out in the woods. It was downtown in this, uh, downtown. In, in a town, there was a ball, and it wasn't a Bigfoot, but there was a ball of light bouncing across. And I go, were the, and, and, but the, the storefronts, he, you know, it's angled parking. He's in his car and he's filming with his camera, these bouncing balls of light. And I said, okay, well, wait a minute, look at this. The storefronts were facing are in the shadows. I says, are there buildings behind you? Oh yeah. 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 There's, I said, do they have plate glass windows? Oh yeah. Yeah. And the sun was hitting those plate glass windows. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, well, uh, I think you're seeing reflections off of those glass windows that they're flexing as the, as the building moves and they're bouncing around a little bit. I mean, it's just not, it's not like they're bouncing along with a sing along. They're just kind of drifting a little bit and coasting around anyway. So as soon as you bring up that kind of stuff, uh, you know, ding, red flag pops up <laughs> and waves in the wind. And so uh, that's the dimension of the Sierra sounds that gives me pause as well. Um, but there's some really cool thing. I mean, the thing that one of the things that really impressed me very early on, besides just the, you know, the interesting, um, character of the, of the interactions, the whistles, there's an exchange where uh, I don't know exactly who is doing the whistling, but someone's whistling through their teeth, you know, and you, and it's muted because they've got the microphone stuck through a little crack in the wiki up there. And then from outside with much greater volume, you know, grandiose volume, you hear this whistle and uh, the, the Sasquatch is, sounds like he's kind of, you know, getting his lips ready and, and then a little test and then, but when he whistles, it sounds like there's a harmonic, like there's an overtone, like there's two people whistling at the same time. And it makes me wonder if they're, whistling not just through their teeth but they're using their pharynx to modulate and make a, a whistling sound from their throat like a bird would make a whistling sound <laughs> birds don't have lips or teeth right. but they make these marvelous vocalizations by by fluctuations of their throat their syrinx and uh, and the throat muscles and so anyway that's always fascinated me and uh but i've challenged and I'll, and I'll keep saying this publicly without apology because I, hopefully, if anything, I can shame him or prod him or cajole him in some way. I have challenged or invited both Scott Nelson to submit, to write up his findings that he presents at the conferences, write it up as in scientific paper or a report, you know, or a summary uh, and, and submit it to the relic hominoid inquiry good opportunity here to plug another uh this is an online journal that i edit the relic with a t hominoid inquiry rhi it's hosted on the isu web server and we're we've been in existence for 13 years i am the managing editor with the assistance of an editorial board of a dozen or more I think we're up to 13 or 14 um, editors, uh, PhDs, as well as other professionals of appropriate skill sets. 
so a great, great source, and it provides a platform for dialogue, not only amongst the enthusiasts, but I send these papers or reports or commentaries out for review, not just to sympathetic reviewers, uh, you know, in in-house reviewers, but I, I look and see who's who are the movers and shakers that are publishing in the professional literature on these topics right now. And I will, you know, send a cold call and invite those individuals to provide some professional, the professional courtesy, professional service of acting as a reviewer. And in 13 years, I've had one person who didn't respond. And sometimes, you know, during the summer, this isn't surprising at all because people are off doing field mm -hmm. work or they're taking their summers off or they're on sabbatical or whatever. I've had one who, who uh, refused or, or declined because he said, I'd love to, this looks interesting, but I have three other papers I have to get reviewed before, uh, you know, their deadlines and I just can't take on an, an additional one. So that's really, so, so what it has provided, and this is why I was so excited about the, the journal, not only as an archive and a venue and a platform for the publication of these things that probably otherwise wouldn't see the light of day through conventional uh, outlets, but it allows me to engage others who probably wouldn't take this on head on by the horns, certainly wouldn't contribute themselves, but as a reviewer or a commentator, are perfectly willing to engage in the conversation and the dialogue. And thereby we've incorporated and, you know, in network with other people uh, and drawn upon their expertise and their perspective and so forth. So my hope is that we could get Scott to submit something that then I could get a dialogue going with reviewers and, and submit it to some peer review get some conversation, get some critical evaluation of his, uh, you know, from a scientific perspective of his uh, interpretations of these vocalizations, at least from a linguist perspective. And, um, but to no avail. I mean, I've been trying for two, three, four years. Well, don't give up. Don't no. give up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know how some people talk about when they see Bigfoot and it's walking, it looks like it's kind of gliding along. Yeah. Can you give your perspective on that and what you think? Oh, absolutely. You think absolutely. And because I, I saw it myself in that, uh, that silhouette of a figure that just seemed to, you know, drift right on up the hillside. I couldn't see its feet because of the obstruction of the berm. Um, I've talked to other witnesses. One was very stunning. It's actually featured in my book, uh, a sighting down on the Oregon coast. And these were two, you know, very thoughtful observers. Both um, were in law enforcement. One was a, a highway patrol officer and one was, uh, I think, in the sheriff's office. But in any case, they were very sober, very level-headed uh, individuals. They commented that it looked like this this figure was literally floating up the beach because there was no characteristic head bob. So when we walk, we tend to maximize our step length by fully extending our limb. And as we you know, we have a heel strike and mid stance at mid stance as our as our center of mass sort of literally pole vaults over that extended limb and so obviously the maximum height is when it's mid step and so our head goes up high and then it goes back down into a trough as we extend out to reach with the next foot for maximal step length when we're really striding i mean and then it's exaggerated that has a tendency to concentrate the strike force, the compressive forces experienced by the body at the heel, the heel strike, and then along that narrow arch and, uh, you know, the, the lower side, the lateral side of the foot, the lateral column, and then across the ball and out the big toe. As we toe off, you know, concentrated again at the end of the arch. 
Well, that works great. I mean, that for us, that provides that stiff leverage of the foot. It's kind of a, extends that length, helps to, to uh, round off that pole vaulting effect. Um, but it concentrates, it concentrates peak plantar pressures. Plantar is refers to that undersurface of the foot. So when heel strike, you know, there's a spike in the, in the, cause all the pressure is concentrated and you have that, that de rapid deceleration, you know, that striking of the heel. And then the push off provides that propulsive Im impulse. So, um, when you increase body mass tremendously and you always have to remember that that body mass the volume increases to the cube of linear dimensions so as we get taller we get disproportionately more massive have more volume and so a creature even just a foot taller and with the body build the very you know endo endomorphic form big you know massive skeleton and heavy musculature more of an ape-like physique than a human with its lean gracile uh, musculoskeletal system we're we're lean mean running and walking machines um you know we're the kind of the marathon runners of the ape family the hominoid family um whereas the ape the sasquatch is still the the linebacker, <laughs> you know, the massive, uh, heavy, heavy musculature and skeleton. Well, so the foot, it just can't be exactly like a human foot just scaled up because it wouldn't keep up because there you're dealing largely with two dimensional surface area and surface area doesn't keep up with the volume. It's the square versus the cube squared dimension versus the cubic dimension so that means there has to be some differences and uh, you know Krantz drew attention first and foremost to this remarkable increase in width of the heel as well as the forefoot so the overall area of the foot is increased in surface area Krantz did a really good job of kind of he showed the uh how how the anatomical modifications what he didn't include however and so he had to kind of fudge his numbers a little bit. i thought he forced the numbers a bit just to show that it was conceivable well you can't quite get there with just the anatomical changes to have a flat foot and a very broad foot see by having flat you have more contact surface um instead of concentrating under the uh, with differential pressure under the heel and the forefoot, you disperse it over the entire foot. And then, in fact, the mid-tarsal break helps with this because you never concentrate everything up at the front of an arch. The entire forefoot pushes off. And the toes are there mostly just for traction to keep from sliding back. They're not really propulsive. Uh, that the big toe, you know, provides some, but I mean, you look at the footprints and the toes very frequently are not pressed down in. Sometimes, in fact, the, the cast looks really weird because what you get is the toes are actually not curving into the soil and they get kind of pushed up. They're not digging in and you only get the bases of the toes. So you get sometimes these little triangular looking toes that look really funny looking well then you but if, if you have the good fortune as i've got examples of uh to go with those here's an, a subsequent footprint where the toes have dug in because of a slight incline or something and you compare the two and you, you realize that over here the little triangles are just the imprint of the of the base of the toe this little bit right down here anyway so um what Krantz didn't include really in his discussion was the behavioral distinctions. And uh, uh, early on in my career, there was a, a paper that got a lot of attention because it uh, addressed some of these issues of how a heavier, bulkier hominid could um, accommodate uh, the compressive forces. 
and that was called Groucho walking. Now, Groucho Marx, the comedian with the cigar and the twiddly mustache and little spectacles, he had this iconic posture, this stance where he would lean forward and walk with flexed limbs, had a very smooth, smooth gait. So the Groucho walk, they discovered, had an interesting um, uh, uh, factor as well. I mean, not only were, was the individual storing elastic energy in the tendons and ligaments around the flexed joints, so it was active loading of those joints, but the ground reaction forces were reduced as much as 18%. So, you know, it's like if you were going to go walking on eggshells across, you know, li literally walking on uh, something very brittle you didn't you didn't or like rice paper if you went goose stepping out there like a like a, a German soldier um, what are the chances of you uh, damaging the rice paper if you wanted to preserve the rice paper you would walk very softly place your entire foot down and you would have your hips and knees and ankles flexed so that you would minimize the amount of impact force so when you also roll that in, and this, this explains the smooth. So now instead of pole vaulting over a stiff leg, an extended leg to maximize step length, they still can reach out there. I mean, they still take long steps, obviously, some remarkably long steps. But on flexed limbs, the head doesn't bob. It walks, it moves forward over this flexed limb that kind of smooths out that that pole vaulting effect of bob that causes the bobbing of the head with each maximal um, uh, maximal point on the arc of the pole vaulting limb support limb um, so all those things together reduce the ground reaction forces per unit surface area of the foot to where they're really almost comparable to humans and I mean, we obviously always kind of push the envelope of, of uh, you know, critical variables for um, uh, failure of tissue in the body. Uh, I mean, we, we want you want to have a certain amount of buffer, but you want to get the most out of what you have. And so um, what what you see in humans, I mean, it's. It's remarkable when you think about it, when you think about the, the amount of force that our feet uh, incur when we're sprinting, say, running full tilt down. Um, I mean, we tend to wear athletic shoes that have big, thick, cushioned soles that, um, and as a result, we've learned to run in an artificial way. The heel strike in, in running, the heel strike type of running is the least preferred. Now the if you look at the the runners, they they have they land on the ball of their foot. The foot comes down and then they push off. But what that does when you land on the ball of your foot, you don't have that abrupt heel strike for one thing. It's much more accommodating, compliant, and it gives the chance what it does is it the um, the shock if you think about the lever system here, if this is my heel, what's attached to it? A big bungee cord-like Achilles tendon or calcaneal tendon. And that elastic, well, it's not that elastic, but the, 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 I, the connective tissue and the muscles contribute as well. But the tendon, the collagen fibers aren't perfectly straight right from the start. They have a certain waviness to them. And that waviness allows them to actually take up some of that shock and and store it as kinetic energy is potential energy that is returned as kinetic energy um, in, in a significant way back into the system kangaroos see have have exploited this strategy to the to the max and so they've got these big uh, long elongated legs and a long heel for leverage at the Achilles tendon, the calcaneal tendon, I should use the proper descriptive term. When they land, 
it loads that tendon. They get up to a certain speed, these big giant red kangaroos in the outback that are going across the desert. They get up to a certain speed and the amount of muscular effort required to maintain that is reduced. I don't know what the actual values are. It's been so long since I've read this literature, but, but it drops way down. And so they're simply loading that tendon and the fascia of the muscle which returns a significant portion of it. It only takes a little bit of muscular contraction to reload that, uh, that, that hind foot and all the ligaments and tendons in the foot within the foot itself and other, other um, tendons like the flexors of the digits and so forth that are also contributing in their own way. It's an amazingly efficient way to just go for mile after mile after mile with very little caloric effort. And I, and I would just add one thing too, to, as, as a kind of a, a, a tie, a bow on the end of this is, is this kind of discussion where you can pick apart the anecdotal and the, the trace uh, evidence, you know, in the form of the footprints and then the analogy to um, uh, models that are evident in case studies of biomechanics. I mean, if, if this was just a bunch of stories, if this was just folklore, you know, it, the, the, uh, Cliff Berrickman said it so well, and, and in so many ways, you know, his, his response was actually in, kind of in reaction to the, the rise of the paranormal, but it was, you know, Bigfoot is biology. And so we, we added a, another couplet. I can't remember if he was responsible for that. I think he was. It was lose the woo, Bigfoot is biology. <laughs> and, uh, but it also, it, it, ha it has to do with the in inherent coherence, the internal correlation of all of these different things in such a remarkably elegant way that it... Uh, it all it makes sense. I mean, it 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 finds um, suitability within the scientific context of of biology, be it the biomechanics, or you know, if we, we went beyond and the correlation between supposed social structure and the appearance of anatomies, say associated with the reproductive system, that make perfect sense the lack of tools and the appearance of the handprints and knuckle prints and so forth that uh, things that, that that give us insight into the function of the thumb that that clearly indicates the lack of a precision grip reliance on a power grip and that correlates with the lack of of uh, manufactured tools you know other than the brandishing of sticks and the clacking of stones or throwing of stones those types of opportunistic behaviors that we see in other great apes or in great apes as well. That I just wanted to add that thing that, you know, don't, don't, don't uh, be turned off by the, what a, the apparent specificity of this example, but, but be amazed at how this example illustrates this cohesive, coherent, big picture that is so remarkably correlated. So give us your definition of Bigfoot, Dr. Meldrum. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think there, and, and this, this isn't to pander to the, to the uh, parties <laughs> involved, but I, but I mean, it's, it's a legitimate, uh, uh, and in fact, I, I'll, I'll be very specific uh, and limited in scope, but I, I entertain two uh, null hypotheses to start with. Obviously, the one that um, is the longest standing and, and has a lot of appeal is Gigantopithecus. You know, in, in Gigantopithecus, either specifically or as representative of a Pleistocene megafauna that included primate species, there was a there was a giant orangutan on the mainland of China, of uh, Asia that is now extinct. Uh, and we have um, three species now of orangutan that are recognized on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra. Um, but there were others, you know, 
just in the past 20, 25 years, we've accumulated over 100 species of great ape that have been discovered, extinct species of great ape. So, so when I point to Gigantopithecus, it is one that's well, well known, <laughs> well, relatively. It's well known, but not well represented even in the fossil record. Um, we've doubled the number of jaws. I had to correct myself when I was uh, uh, pointing out what I thought was a flaw in a paper, but then dig doing some digging, there have been two more jaws added. So we are up to four, four isolated jaws attributed to Gigantopithecus blackie, the large, most latest living species, and a few thousand isolated teeth. But we, it as a species, it is the right size in the right place at the right time. We're left though with this uncertainty as to its locomotor behavior. Was it bipedal or was it quadrupedal? Well, when you're a giant ape, there's only one, uh, it's 50-50. I mean, it's, it's either or, it's not 50-50. It's either or. It's either you're on all fours or you're walking on all two or on both <laughs> your feet, all, all your feet. Um, if you're an ape that's that has the legacy, even as we still have to this day, of a broad chest, flattened AP, shoulder blades on the back sides of our rib cage, and a very mobile shoulder joint, those are um, legacies of climbing behaviors, overhead arm postures, climbing and hanging. And as a result, that very mobile shoulder and elbow, and especially the wrist, uh, make it unlikely that we would do well on all fours. In fact, humans, you know, uh, many people who go down, drop down to, to do push-ups, experience pain in their wrist and uh, find relief if they either do push-up on the backs of their knuckles or their fist or have those little gadgets, the little handles on the bases that, that you do your push-ups on. You know, that works really great because then your, your wrist is not experiencing the sheer pushing, pushing the palm past the <clears throat> forearm bones. Anyway, what that means is it's better than a 50-50 chance that something as big and heavy as a Gigantopithecus, which is going to be restricted to the ground, isn't necessarily walking around with its hands like this. It may, maybe it had evolved uh, a knuckle walking posture, which is why the gorillas and chimps do that. Um, orangs, their fingers are so long that they just ball them up into a fist. And they, they sometimes walk on the backs of their knuckles, but they often fist walk, just using the side of the heel of the palm. <clears throat> All right. But that, that, that won't be resolved until someone walks out of a cave in southern China or North Vietnam, northern Vietnam, with a femur, you know, or a pelvis of a, of a Gigantopithecus. Um, Gordon Strasenberg, to give credit where credit's due, had championed the notion of a very flat-faced hominin, the robust Australopithecines, particularly um, Paranthropus boisei. Problem is, wrong size, wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> Only stood about five feet tall, re resided in East Africa, and was thought to have gone extinct well over 800,000 years ago. But what's amazing, and, and Gordon never quite got it to this point, he drew, he drew some interesting analogies to native depictions, which he drew anal of, of uh, you know, folkloric interpretations of, of uh, wild men, which he drew comparisons to the robust Australopithecines. But, but I took the skull of Paranthropus, and if you just put it up next to a close-up bust, enlargement of, of the bust of Patty, what is stunning, I mean literally stunning, almost as stunning as the footprints, not quite, but pretty close. <laughs> um, point for point, this highly modified and specialized cranial dental uh, anatomy, cranial facial anatomy of Paranthropus is reflected in 
Patty's facial proportions, cranial facial proportions. So from the top of her head to her receding jaw, and every point in between, the flat face, the forward jutting cheekbones, you know, to give the masseter muscle that real anterior leverage to load the posterior dentition. Um, all of those features seem to re be reflected in in uh, Sasquatch uh, face, at least Patty's, insofar as she represents, and I'm quite confident that she does, a typical Sasquatch uh, facial morphology. Also, one of the distinguishing features of these thick uh, enameled enlarged toothed hominids is that they have lost their projecting canines. They've been reduced down to short nubbins that wear tip to tip, which allows the jaws to grind side to side, rather than being rather locked by those interlocking can projecting canines into more or less an open and close with limited side to side movement. And so this was, uh, you know, this is the standard depiction by Native Americans of the of the wild man, the Bukwas, with squared off teeth and witnesses who have had the good fortune of a close enough encounter to, to witness the teeth have also talked about squared off human looking teeth. And so could something like a Paranthropus, well, and I, I would add that many of those specializations of the face, uh, which are correlated with the extremely thick enamel on the molar and premolar teeth uh, are probably to be found in Gigantopithecus as well because this big heavy jaw is supporting these massive hyper thickly enameled teeth um, would almost certainly be also associated with a much flatter face not a projecting we we do have canines of the Gigantopithecus which are short and wear end to end they have very similar incisors with those of Paranthropus as far as the central or slightly larger than the lateral, what we call heteromorphic incisors. Anyway, um, it's very possible that, uh, because we now know that there were hominins radiating out of, or even originating in Asia, radiating out of Africa into Asia, uh, or there's a good argument to be made that the ancestors of the gorilla and chimp actually did evolve in in Asia, around Turkey and in, in Asia Minor, and then uh, spread as did so many other animals which we think of as being unique to East Africa. That, you know, that fauna, that typical fauna of the Serengeti Plains, many of those things like giraffes, for example, the iconic giraffe, actually evolved in Asia. And during periods when the, the habitat was quite contiguous down into East Africa, expanded their range, became isolated or uh, separated down in there, went extinct in Asia, as the climate shifted and so forth. Um, but could have spread through Asia into um, the Far East and during the Pleistocene, as did so many other animals especially species that colonize the more northerly latitudes experience gigantism and and extreme hirsutism hairiness so the woolly mammoth the woolly rhinoceros and so forth these animals um what what really uh should uh, ma made that prospect much more probable in my mind was the discovery of the hobbit homo floresiensis because in spite of early misdirected notions that it was a dwarf form of Homo erectus, um, it actually was, has been demonstrated to show little or no affinity to Homo erectus. Rather, the affinities, the closest affinities are to the late Australopithecines, and Homo habilis, which is essentially just a, uh, an Australopithecine with a slightly bigger brain and slightly smaller premolars. Um, but um, still extremely primitive in its tool use, tool manufacture, and so forth. And in, in fact, the flakes that are attributed to 
Homo habilis have now also been associated with Australopithecines. So the real jump isn't until you come to Homo erectus where there's a dramatic increase in body size, a decrease in sexual dimorphism in body size between males and females, and, and all the other things that go with Homo erectus, the remarkable toolkit, uh, very sophisticated um, manufacture of stone tools, big game hunting, home bases, fire control, all these things that, that really showed the emergence of the genus Homo. But the hobbit, then, its closest affinities are to species that are clear over here in Africa. Uh, so there's several chapters of the book that, that are missing. <laughs> what happened between point A and point Z over here? <laughs> and, uh, and with that, uh, recognition, why couldn't a paranthropus with this remarkable adaptation have increased in body mass uh, as it as it spread into the northern latitudes and, and, and then eventually gave rise to, so, to Sasquatch. So the interesting thing about this is we're on either side of this split between the apes and the human ancestors and, and collaterals. But we're so close. I mean, well, Gigantopithecus, who knows where. It's, it seems to um, share the greatest affinity to the orangutan. But there was a, I mean, there are probably a, two or three dozen other species from that extended family of which Gigantopithecus and the orangutan are now the, um, the relics that we're looking at. And I can, I, I'm, I'm including Gigantopithecus as a relic because it survived uh, in the known fossil record later than any other species of extinct ape, um, possibly as recently as 200 or maybe 300,000 years ago. So it was a Pleistocene. It was the, the fifth great ape, if you will, if we have orangutans, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and Gigantopithecus just about. That would be, but would have been something if instead of uh, instead of uh, the giant panda in the in the New York Zoo or where or the Washington Zoo, I guess that's where they ended up. We had a Gigantopithecus on exhibit. Yeah, that yeah that'd be so. <laughs> and and there there is this lag that we're experiencing because back in the '60s and and even into the '70s, there was um, there was a, a prevailing notion in anthropology that viewed human evolution as this rather singular uh, process. Uh, the hominin niche was viewed as being so particular, so exclusive that there could be only one species in, in that niche at any given time. It's called, you know, based on the principle of competitive exclusion that first was proposed in microbiology decades earlier. And so with that notion, the hominin niche, as exclusive as it was, was currently occupied by Homo sapiens. So there was no other place, no hook, to hang another species of bipedal hominin. And so when Roger Patterson, well, even, even earlier, in 1962, Ivan Sanderson published his classic tome on uh, abominable snowman legend come to life in which he proposed four groups, four categories of, he called them, used the acronym ABSM, short for abominable snowmen. Um, you know, wild men would have been a better, uh, I, I, we use the term relic hominoid now. But in any case, he, he uh, suggested four. But the problem was there was no accommodation for those suggestions, those suggested four types. There wasn't accommodation for one other type because we were it. So they all had to be, you know, just fanciful uh, imaginations. And then when Roger, you know, plays his film for the panel at the Smithsonian, they have the same attitude. There could be only one. 
So it has to be a hoax. So how are we going to justify our conclusion that it's a hoax? You know, they didn't, could, weren't going to explain to the public about the single species hypothesis and, and its implications. You know, a little, that's a little too esoteric. But instead, they said silly things like, oh, well, it has breasts, but they're covered with hair. And everyone knows that primates don't have hair on their breasts. Well, which is a bunch of baloney. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I try to uh, delicately suggest that, uh, you know, to the ladies in the audience, ne you know, next time you step out of the shower and it's a little chilly, just take note. What's all over your chest? Goosebumps. Every single goosebump is a little hair follicle with a muscle attached to the root of a rudimentary hair that causes that <laughs> skin to pucker up. Or if there is hair present, the hair to stand on end to try to capture a little bit of air to make a, a little in layer of insulation. Or when you're frightened, your hair stands on end to make you look bigger. You know, if you've ever seen a chimpanzee show this, uh, and I have, again, plug my book, there's a picture. I, uh, I, I um, uh, asked widely of various uh, field primatologists if they had any good pictures or or veterinarians and so forth the zoos got an excellent one which is in the book of this very agitated chimpanzee and his hair is like a cat's tail it's just sticking up like a porcupine and they do that to make themselves look really big and bulky um just as the cat same reaction or the dogs with the hairs hair standing mm -hmm. on its on its end it makes them look bigger so those were the kinds of silly comments um, since we talked so much about walking, one one of the panelists said, "Well, you know, it 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 portrays or attempts to portray a female, and yet it walks like a man. Well, why do human females walk like human females as opposed to human males? Because they have wider hips for an increased birth canal, and puts the hip." Uh, sockets farther apart and allows the pelvis to list a little bit more with each step because the the weight is supported under one side and so it tips a little bit away and it's exaggerated because of the distance whereas in a male that tipping is greatly reduced well what would a sasquatch look like it has a brain the size of a chimpanzee or a gorilla relatively speaking and so it doesn't have a greatly increased brain or a, a birth canal to accommodate that enlarged brain. So a female Sasquatch has a pelvis that has dimensions that are essentially s the same as a, as a male Sasquatch and therefore walks like a male, which is more similar to a human male. You know, those are the kind of things which at the time they would have been embarrassing. And now in, in 2020 hindsight, you know, it's just like, it's like, these were my colleagues. These were the people I was emu emulating, you know. <laughs> Just really silly, inane statements like that, that um, we ha now have the advantage of 2020 hindsight, 55 years later. And so much of what you see on that film actually anticipates, sometimes by decades, discoveries and revelations that have been made, things that we have now come to recognize. But back then, that portrayal, first of all, I mean, th there would have been no inspiration for a Roger Patterson to come up with that concoction of combinations of traits. And yet, if he had someone in the wings that was coaching him, you know, trying to make a convincing, um, you know, bipedal ape-like creature, they were giving him all the, uh, all the wrong information for the time, unless that guy had a crystal ball <laughs> to allow him to predict future discoveries in anthropology. That, that's what's so fascinating to me about it. It's a, there is such, there is so much below the surface of that, of that film and its history, as far as the, the fundamental scientific uh, uh, elements that are integrated within it anthropological elements i mean i just yeah if if anything it just gets it gets more and more frustrating sometimes mm -hmm. especially even as as it comes kind of comes to a head through these conversations it i i just find myself mm -hmm. uh, thinking my word you know what well i know i when i i just about to say what does it take what would it take 
uh, and it takes a body, doesn't it? It takes a physical specimen. Ultimately, that's what, what it's going to pivot upon. Your book, Sasquatch Meets Science, where can our listeners get a copy of that? Amazon. Amazon.com obviously has it. It's listed there as well as uh, another source uh, that I would point you to because there's also some cool other stuff as well as some of my other books are uh, to be found on uh, Paradise K Publishing, which is para K, that's P-A-R-A-C-A-Y. K, I guess, is an, an antiquated term for a, a bay or an inlet. Okay. And they're they're over in Northern California near in Arcade, I believe it is. Parakay.com. And they have a whole section uh, in uh, in their publishing catalog of Bigfoot books, as well as all kinds of neat uh, Bigfoot paraphernalia. Okay, cool. I know Brian's going to be checking that out. Yeah. Later. Yeah, I'm writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> what conventions are you going to yet this year? What big ones anyway? Oh, gee, there's a bunch. Um, uh, one by that name, the big conference, is just this weekend. I'm just getting ready to go this weekend out to Denver. Um, and, uh, oh, what else is there? They're all over. There's North Carolina. There's Minnesota. There's um, uh, British Columbia. Uh, oh, are, you going yeah. to, are you at Crypticon this year in Lexington? Was I thinking you were there no, for some reason? No, I don't think I am. I, well, let's see. <laughs> I can't keep track, quite honestly. Uh, that's in Kentucky? Yep. Uh, yep, Lexington, Kentucky, November, the weekend before Thanksgiving. Oh, no. No, I'm not. Okay. Because that one competes with um, Ocean Shores Okay. out in Washington. Um, uh, but I am in Kentucky, uh, Bowling Green. In uh, the first weekend of August, there's a, an event there. I saw that you're doing like a mini con or something there, right? That could be. You know, honestly, if I get it on the calendar, <laughs> I, I leave uh, the details for a couple weeks before the event because I just can't keep track and keep on top of everything. Yep. So as long as I'm on top with enough time to prepare what needs to be done, then I'm I'm successful. <laughs> awesome. Well, Dr. Meldrum, we appreciate you being here with us tonight and taking the yeah, time. Yeah, we do. This was so cool. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Well, it's my my pleasure. It's always uh, it's always fun to to uh, visit and contemplate and think about things from from new new points of uh, departure. Well, we hope to run into you at another convention and we can hang out sometime and talk a little bit more. Okay. All right, sounds I'd good. I'd like to get you back on the show too because we could have. This could have been a four-hour. Oh, yeah, I can. I got. Yeah, <laughs> maybe someday down the road when you're not too busy, we can get you back on because I got plenty sure. of questions. <laughs> you bet. Happy to do that. All right. Well, you have a good evening. We yeah. thank you again, Thanks, sir. Doctor. All right. Take care. I can't say enough how cool it was to get him on the show tonight. Man. Oh man, what a great guy. He's awesome. And he is super, super knowledgeable. He is. It's amazing. He's way more cooler than, than you think he is, too. When you meet him oh, first. yeah. And I could have talked to him forever. This could have been a longer longer episode. Could have made it a four-hour episode, but I know It could have been too. easily. Yeah. But, um, maybe down the road we'll get him back on and talk to him some more. I hope so. I hope so. That'd be fun. It was really awesome having him on the show. That's all I can say, and I'm really glad that yeah. we talked to him. So. Yep, me too. I hope you guys all enjoyed it, too. Yes. And again, listeners, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you all. Yep, we appreciate every one of you. Couldn't do this without you. That's right. Brian, my friend, I couldn't do this without you either, buddy. Same here, brother. Let's take off. What do you say? Yep, yep. See ya. See ya.